I'm Veronica. Uh, I have bipolar disorder and panic disorder with agoraphobia. Um, and <clears throat> I'm able to be here today and I'm able to get my PhD and, and able to go out in the world because of my psych service dogs. And just as a kind of um, segue from your talk, my first service dog was half pit bull and half Weimariner. Um, my second one is obviously a poodle. The haircut, that was a dead giveaway for him. <laughs> All right, you can advance to the next slide. So my talk today is going to be divided into three parts. And the first part of the talk is going to be just a real quick overview of the two major ways that, that one might obtain a psychiatric service dog. Can go to the next slide. The second part of my talk is going to be talking about the public access training, or basically the training that um, allows your dog not to create a disturbance or a disruption. Um, third one. And then finally, we'll be talking about um, the, the tasks or work, and this will be the bulk of my, my talk, the tasks or work that dogs can do for various different uh, mental illnesses. So there are two main ways that people can go about obtaining a psychiatric service dog. Um, there are lots of in-between ways, and I'm going to leave those for now. Uh, the two main ways are to get a dog from a program and to train a dog yourself. And I think both ways hold a lot of merit. And it really depends on um, the individual and what is going on in their life, what experiences they've had, and, and their disorder, and where they are in dealing with their disorder, um, which way they choose. Um, getting a program trained dog is really nice because you get this dog and it's already trained. You don't have to teach it to sit. You don't have to house train it. You know, so it's, it's already trained. Um, it can start working for you immediately, which is really great, but it has some drawbacks. Usually the waiting list for um, dogs from programs can be about one to two years. And some of the dogs can be really expensive. A lot of the psychiatric service dog training programs are not as well funded as, for example, the guide dog training programs. And so the dogs can cost often $5,000, all the way up to $20,000 or more dollars just for a dog. So that, that is really difficult. And the final thing that, that can be a drawback with a, a dog from a program is that um, one of the things that psychiatric service dogs do for us, which I'll talk more about later, is they learn our baseline, um, how our baseline behaviors, our baseline mood are, and they can learn to alert us to changes in our baseline, which can be really helpful in pretty much every mental illness that, that anyone could have. And so if you're partnered with a, a dog from a program, usually the team training time where you're with a professional trainer is a few weeks. And so that's not really quite enough time for the trainer to, to really get in there, your dog learning your baseline. Um, but you can always do it afterwards. It's just you have to add on that training afterwards. Or your dog might naturally learn how to do it, as it seems Tuesday has done. Um, so if you train, not yet, sorry. If you train a dog yourself, um, I they kind of already have gone through most of those. Um, you can get a dog right away, but it's still going to take one to two years to train it. So do you want to spend the one to two years waiting for the dog, or do you want to spend the one to two years working with the dog that is going through the process of training. Um, the cost is really comparable. Um, I've done it twice now, and it's cost me about $5,000 both times. The first time I used a shelter dog, and um, I had to have increased training expenses. The second time, I, with Ollie, I, um, I pur purchased a dog from a breeder who breeds for service work. And so my training expenses were lowered, but the purchase price was a lot higher. So, you know, it's really kind of a trade-off. And for me, the biggest benefit of training my own service dog has been that I learned so much about my mental illness, dealing with my mental illness, and, and conquering it, really, because you have this puppy that comes home, and you have to socialize this puppy. You have to get it to meet, like, 100 people in the first 100 days of its life is the re recommendation, right? If you're agoraphobic, that is, like, kind of an insane request. But, you know, you do it because you have to do it for your dog. And so you're, it's kind of like a form of exposure therapy all throughout the training of your dog. You know, you're afraid to go to malls and big open spaces like that. But you have to do it because you have to train your dog to do it. So it's really a great way to work through some of your fears and phobias with your therapist's advice and, and help um, in training your own service dog. But not everyone is up for it. 
So mm -hmm. go to the next slide. So um, the Psychiatric Service Dog Society um, really does kind of promote the owner training model because that's what most of our clients use is the owner training model. And we have some general steps that we recommend people take. And these are steps that we recommend people take both for their own good because it um, will help them out. We also recommend they, they take these steps because these steps will provide them with hopefully a legally defensible case should they ever have to go to court. And so the first step is first, you know, figure out if you have a disability and talk, talk, talk. Talk to your doctor about um, what a dog might be able to do to assist you. Talk with other psychiatric service dog handlers about what it's like to go out with a dog, to experience some of these public access challenges, to have people staring at you. For some people, it's not worth it, you know. So you've got to really learn about psych service dogs first. And this picture that's here shows a group of local psychiatric service dog handlers who get together and we often will help people who are unsure if they want a dog or not, um, we'll help them kind of talk about it and figure it through. The second step that I have, the second step that I have on there is to evaluate the dog. So yeah, there you go. And make sure you start with the right dog. Um, a lot of people, they are like, I'm gonna get a psych service dog and they grab the first dog they see and they, you know, maybe stuck with a dog that has some severe challenges. So getting a trainer involved um, early on is really helpful to you. It'll make you um, have a lot easier time. It'll set you up for success. And also having a trainer involved from the very beginning stages saying, you know, yes, this dog is a good candidate for service work will be helpful proof if you ever have to go to a court case. Um, so then the third step is basic obedience and we, the canine good citizen test, which is a test that any pet dog can take is just kind of a basic behavior test. And we recommend that you, um, if you're training your own service dog or one of your clients is, that they keep a training log of all these, these basic obedience behaviors of their canine good citizen test if they choose to take it, it's not required. Um, and these are a good, you know, kind of like starting point. And up until step three, we do not recommend vesting your dog and taking it out as a service dog in training. All the way up through step three, we recommend keeping the dog unvested, only visiting pet-friendly places. I can go to the next slide. So step four is, um, is you can work on also during steps one, two, and three, is training your dog to do disability-specific work or tasks. And I'm going to spend a whole lot of time at the end of my talk talking about that, so I'm going to kind of gloss over it for the moment. Um, step five is working on public access behaviors. These are behaviors like um, your dog should be able to walk past other dogs while with ignoring them. Your dog should be able to go to a grocery store and not sniff in the meat section. Your dog should be able to go to a restaurant and not eat off the floor or the crumbs. Those type of things are public access behaviors. And so we recommend that you spend at least six months training public access behaviors. And again, for um, your case to be defensible if you should ever have to go to court, we recommend that you keep a training log and log every time you go out and how your dog does. Um, and if you have video proof or photographic proof, even better. Uh, the last step is something that's not required by law, um, but it is something that a lot of people choose to do, which is a public access test. And this, um, a lot of people keep mentioning certification. Certification is not required by law. This public access test is not required by law, but um, it is something that you can do to kind of prove to yourself and have in your arsenal should you ever have to go to court. So the video here, hopefully we can get it to play, is an excerpt of Ollie's public access test. Um, we're doing a food challenge here. So that's a big plate of french fries going on the floor. <laughs> He's not allowed to eat them. And then we go back to eating the french fries because they're that good. <laughs> so um, this is a picture actually of my first service dog, Sabrina, who is a Weimariner Pitbull mix. And um, the, this final section of the talk is going to function, it's going to center around what can service dogs do, what can psych service dogs do for people with various mental illness. And the Americans with Disability Act has said that service dogs can do work or tasks. And there's a lot of confusion in the psych service dog community and actually in the service dog community as a whole as to what exactly is work and what is a task. 
And so um, one of the handouts that's up uh, on the table out there is from the Psychiatric Service Dog Society. It's a work and task list that um, we have created to help people understand what is the difference between work and tasks. And basically, Sabrina there is doing a physical task. A physical task is something that you can see very easily. She's bringing me my medicine, right? Very easy to see that she's doing something to assist me. Um, work, on the other hand, is, is subtler things that maybe an outside observer might not notice are happening. Like, for example, you might have noticed that Ollie has been occasionally standing up and kind of headbutting me. He's actually alerting to my anxiety. That's, that's one form of, of work. So we divide work into three kind of subcategories. And the first one is cognitive behavioral work. And if you are familiar with cognitive behavioral therapy, um, it's, it's pretty similar to that. And in fact, um, I have used my service dog um, in cognitive behavioral therapy in a partial hospitalization program and also with my therapist. Um, and basically, you, the dog does something to engage your cognitive behavioral thinking process. So it's a way of like the dog telling you, okay, you need to change your thinking pattern. Do you need to think about this in a different way? That type of thing. Um, the second one is leveraging a dog's natural senses. And um, basically, dogs are really aware of our environment, and we can take advantage of that. And I'll talk more about this um, in, later on, but my favorite example is hallucination discernment. So um, dogs naturally will notice people in a room. Dogs will naturally not kind of react if there's no one in a room. So if you have a hallucination um, and you're not sure if somebody in the room is real or not, you can look to your dog and through, through training with your dog, um, you know, you're training your dog to respond to people with their natural body language, um, then you can use that. You can read your dog's natural sensing of the environment to know that, hey, there's no one standing over there with a scary mask and a knife in his hand or something like that. Um, it's, it's been a real lifesaver for many people that I know. Uh, and the final form of work is mind-body regulatory work, which is basically the dog does something to engage the handlers um, uh, trying to uh, control their own emotions. So you might, this might take the form of taking a PRN medication like Ativan or uh, Clonopin, one of the medications that will help kind of stop a panic attack in its tracks or make it less severe. Um, it could invo involve the dog alerting you to do some grounding exercises um, or any other type of breathing exercises to help you calm down. So if you can go to the next slide. So this is a picture of a woman who has major depressive disorder and her dog is providing deep um, pressure stimulation. I'm not going to read the quote out loud to you. I'll give you uh, a couple of seconds to read it through. So um, basically, this handler it has major depressive disorder and has a really hard time getting out of the house. Um, and one of the things that can happen when you have major depressive disorder is you have these um, you know, feelings of isolation, you have um, sadness or cheerfulness. These are all things listed in the DSM. Um, you have all these symptoms that, that happen, and in this case, She's using deep pressure stimulation, which means a dog is laying on her body and providing a, a constant pressure, which helps to alleviate these, these symptoms. This can be very useful for anxiety and other disorders as well. So some other things that, um, that this particular team does and that also can be done in general, um, for major depression, suicidal ideation is something that a lot of people um, suffer from. So something that can be done is grounding the handler, um, which is like you might have seen earlier Ollie doing with me. Um, if he leans into me and I really focus on his, on his uh, hair, I focus on his body, on his breathing, um, that's the same thing as you know, that exercise where you put your feet on the floor and you're back in the chair and you're, you really ground yourself to reality. The dogs can really help with that grounding. And um, that's a form of work. Uh, and another thing that, that they can do with suicidal ideation or with self-mutilation um, is you can train your dog to, to lay on the parts of your body that you wish to injure. 
Um, and this really helps. You, it sounds like, you know, it's not gonna help, but it helps an amazing amount. I've, I've used this in my dogs for years. Um, you train them to lay on the part of the body that you want to injure or that, you know, lay on, on you if you're feeling like getting up and getting some medications and taking too many of them or something. And you train the dog to stay even when you want to get up. And that really helps. It, it mitigates this, this, these desires to hurt yourself. Um, so let's go on to the next slide. We've got a lot to do and go through. Excuse me, could you read the slides? Because some of us are visually impaired and can't read. Them. Yeah, I can't. Can someone who is from out there, because I can't see them from where I am. One, okay. Is this the bipolar one? Yeah. One. This one, major yeah. depressive? Major depressive disorder. My, my psychological service dog wakes me up when my depression causes hypersomnia. If I don't wake up, I can go for days without leaving the bed or eating and caring for myself. She helps me when I have memory loss due to depression. She knows to find certain items when I misplace them, like my keys or purse, even if, they, even if they're right in my hands and I didn't notice them. Thank you. And can you go ahead and read the next one, too? Sorry, I can't read them here. Bipolar disorder. When I'm approaching mania, Iris responds by nudging me until I slow down and focus on her. This not only fo forces me to notice my manic symptoms, it grounds me and interrupts the racing thoughts. Thank you. So um, this is a picture of, um, of a very good friend of mine who has bipolar disorder. And she has described in this quote uh, some of the ways that her service dog assists her with her bipolar disorder. Um, the way that my service dog helps me with my bipolar disorder when I get manic, instead of um, the hyperfocus, is he will actually repeatedly drop things in my lap <laughs> to try to get me, because I get like hyperfocused on my computer or on cleaning or something like that. Um, so a lot of our service dogs have learned to to naturally alert us to our changes in our in, in our mood from our baseline behavior, um, and we think that we don't have any proof for this. But but many people who have psych service dogs have thought that um, there's maybe some olfactory cue or something else like that that the dogs are picking up on that let them know that we're about to go into an incipient epi manic episode because uh, a lot of them are able to warn before that episode actually happens. Um, all right, let's go ahead on to the next one. Panic and anxiety disorders. Before I even know I am anxious, Oliver alerts to my rising anxiety levels and grounds me to help me stay present and even avoid panic attacks. This particular photo was when I was past my normal level and he was helping calm me by laying his face on mine and I was petting him, smelling him, and feeling his breathing. Thank you. This is a, a, another very good friend of mine. Um, She's actually out of town today, unfortunately, um, but she'll, she was going to be able to come if it was being held tomorrow. Um, and so this is a great, another great example of what grounding looks like. Um, grounding can look very different depending on the specific needs of the handler and um, how the dog works. For instance, my dog sitting on my lap like that would look rather comical. So he <laughs> usually puts his head on me instead of you know sitting in my lap like that. Um, so another thing for anxiety disorder uh, is sleep disturbance is really big for a lot of people with anxiety disorder. Um, they wake up and they're very, very anxious and cannot get back to sleep. Um, and one of the things that a dog can be trained to do is a dog can be trained to keep you in the bedroom until a certain time, until say like an alarm has gone off. The dog can be trained to you know, keep you in the bedroom and even further, lay on top of you and provide some grounding or deep pressure stimulation to help you with your anxiety and to help keep you in the bed so that you don't start pacing around the house and your anxiety just gets you know, more and more and more. Um, so that's an, another example of, of, that would be physical task or work, depending on how, the, how it was trained. Um, and then another thing is you can train the dog to um, alert you if there are intruders. So like, for instance, doing one, one bark if there's a knock at the door or if someone comes in the door, there's one bark, and that's it. So that way you know if your dog has not barked once, you know when you wake up in a panic thinking that there's somebody in your room or somebody in your apartment, you know that's not the case because you know you can trust your dog would have done that one bark or whatever it would normally do to alert you to intruders. 
So I can go to the next slide. So this is a picture of me. Louis, can you read it? Thanks. Agoraphobia. Without my psychological service dog, psychiatric service dog, I can't Doesn't matter. My psychiatric <laughs> service dog, I cannot leave the house knowing Ollie will alert to my panic attacks before they happen so that I can usually stop a full-blown panic attack has given me the confidence to not only leave my house, but also go on a train trip to the Grand Canyon. So this was a, a big deal. Thank you, Luis, again. This was a big deal. I had actually um, attempted suicide uh, about six months before this picture was taken, and I was completely agoraphobic. I was really unable to leave my house. And um, through a, a, an intensive uh, partial hospitalization program that, that used Ollie and cognitive behavioral therapy together, um, I was able to take this trip to the Grand Canyon, which was a huge thing for someone who's agoraphobic like I am. Um, so for agoraphobia, just leaving the house is so anxiety inducing sometimes. Um, and so your dog can be trained to do all different sorts of, of physical tasks or work, physical tasks being things like bringing you your shoes, bringing you the leash, bringing you whatever you need to leave the house, which makes it a little bit easier, you know, when there's a dog bringing you your shoes rather than your husband bringing you your shoes and you kind of want to throw your shoes at your husband saying, no, I don't feel like leaving the house. Um, but your dog brings the shoes and you know, oh, well, I trained them to do that, so I have to take the shoes. So I have to, you know, I have to go and take my dog for a walk. Um, things like that, uh, physical tasks help out a lot, as well as the work of, um, you know, a lot of times initiating the activity and the interaction with people outside of the home so that you're not so scared to, to leave the house. So that instead of going out and the world being a scary place, the world becomes a place where everybody smiles when they see you because they see your dog and where people interact with you in positive ways, which is, you know, kind of like this feedback loop, getting you more and more comfortable going outside your comfort zone. Social focus. Before pumpkin, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's pumpkin. <laughs> Before pumpkin, I had increasingly refrained from any type of traveling or socialization. No family dinners out, going to Disneyland with my family, and absolutely no social events with people outside of my family. Now, with my psychiatric service dog, I am highly respected and productive math computer teacher. I am also a mentor teacher to new teachers, as well as teaching home hospital students when necessary. Without Pumpkin, I would have had to go out on disability. Thank you. So um, this individual um, is, is a very good teacher, uh, but she had an incident that, um, that made it so that she couldn't go back to work. Um, and, and until she realized that she had a pet dog that was alerting her and helping her through her social phobia, and she has other diagnoses as well, PTSD is one of them. Um, so she was unable to go back to work, she was unable to teach, and her, uh, she was able to train her dog to be a service dog and then be able to go back and now she's a very successful and highly regarded teacher um, for a lot of students that have disabilities themselves. Uh, and, and it's really been a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, thing for her to be able to, to go out. Um, and so some of the things that service dogs can do for people with social phobia is, um, and this was the same with agoraphobia as well, is initiate this interactions with other people. Um, and so you can, a lot of people with social phobia are really nervous about other people being good people, safe people, you know? And so if you have trained, you can use the, your dog's natural senses. A dog naturally senses which are good people and which people are not so good. Um, sorry, hold on. Sitting on the leash. Uh, and so you can use your dog's natural senses. If your dog looks at someone and kind of, you know, goes, a, away from them with their body language, you can say, okay, well then I'm going to stay away from that person. I don't have to worry about that person. I know my dog has warned me. I'm not going to, that's not a safe person. Then, you know, you walk away around to another person and your dog greets that person, you know, has the, the happy, calm body language with that person. You know, you can trust that person. And so your dog's natural senses become almost an extension of your own natural senses and you start to learn to trust again and you learn to engage with other people.
And you can even learn to memorize responses to oftenly asked questions about your service dog so that you can, you can start to actually have conversations with people and it's even, you know, going into questions that maybe you haven't rehearsed. So can you go to the next one? And this was the long one, sorry, Luis. <laughs> I know this one. Post-traumatic stress disorder. I am very uncomfortable when people invade my personal space. So Mickey calmly and quietly positions himself between me and approaching strangers. Since I often lose track of time, he is trained to bring my medication in response to an alarm on my cell phone. If I become disoriented while walking in our neighborhood, he will take me home. In response to a pending panic attack, Mickey leads me from the situation and finds a quiet place where I can recover. I suffer from night terrors and Mickey wakes me when I show signs of agitation in my sleep. Without him, my quality of life would be very poor. Thank you. Um, and so I think that goes over almost all of the, the post-traumatic stress disorder ones that I was listing here. But this individual, um, before using her service dog, she was a homebound. She couldn't leave her house because she was um, too afraid of people coming up behind her, people startling her, and, and a repeat of possibly the same thing that caused her PTSD in the first place. And now with her service dog, she does public speaking engagements around her state um, of Ohio, and she is uh, starting doing dog training for other people, and just a, a complete turnaround in a person's life because she now feels like she has someone who can watch her back and who can help her out if she needs it. So um, I think we just have three or three more. Obsessive compulsive disorder. Because of my service dog, I can avoid reacting to my usual triggers with rituals and instead use my dog to ground me and work through the triggers. Sasha assists me consistently with exposure therapy. For example, a normal trigger, such as dirt on the floor, must be dealt with when my service dog is the one getting his feet dirty. Also, tactile stimulation, and even more so, deep pressure bringing down the anxiety that leads to OCD symptoms. And by by his very presence and my desire to remain in contact with him, I am more likely to remain in contact with myself, which leads to far less symptomology. And so this is a friend of mine, um, and the dog is actually performing work right here in this picture. Um, we are out at a restaurant, which is a big trigger for this individual for her OCD symptoms because of, of dirt on the floor. It was actually in the Ikea restaurant, so you know there's lots of kids throwing stuff on the floor. Um, and she normally is, is unable to eat in restaurants because of her, of her OCD. And the pressure that her dog is applying, just laying his, le his head on her leg, um, is enough to help keep her grounded, keep her remembering, you know, I don't need to do my rituals, I don't, you know, and she's able to eat out at restaurants now. I mean, not, not often yet, because they're a very new team, but this is something that, that was previously an area of life completely closed off to her before that has now been opened up. Um, and especially in this area, you know, you gotta go to the restaurants, they're great. So um, I think we're running short on time, so we'll go to the next one. Dis dissociative identity disorder. Having been DID for years, I knew integration of all my personalities was what I wanted. Since getting snuggled up, I was no longer trapped in my fears of triggers or anxiety, which caused splitting, and I can face and I can face the world as a whole person and have sorry and have since getting snuggle button <laughs> become fully integrated. So for those of you not familiar with dissociative identity disorder, um, it's uh, what used to be called multiple personality disorder. Um, basically, this individual had based many individuals inside of their head, um, and so they would switch. The switching means they would switch from one individual to another. So oftentimes, you know, she would switch to a small child. And the small child is completely lost. The small child thinks it's like 1970 or something like that. And is completely lost, does not know where they are. And it, it just is, you know, what, what do they do? They 
cry, they, they don't know what to do, they don't know how to get home, they might not even remember their home, they might be living in a completely different place than when they were in 1971. Um, you know, and, and this type of switching is excavated by stress. So when there's more stress, there's more switching, and the ideal, for this person at least, she wanted to have an integrated personality, which means all of the different um, personalities in her. She wanted to combine them into one so that they can all be present at the same time. That's what integration is. And she was unable to do that until she got the help of her psychiatric service dog, who, by providing the, the alerting to switching, alerting to anxiety, and cal gen general calming behaviors, um, helping her out with those, uh, she was able to become fully integrated. And she now also goes on speaking tours around her, around her state. Um, and it's just amazing to see the change in these people that, that pr before were just afraid to leave home because they never knew when they would, what they would wake up as. Last one. Schizophrenia. Frisco is trained to turn on the lights and search the house on command due to my paranoia. Since I get lost in my thoughts and voices, he is able to find my son and bring me to him and learning to find my car, my keys, purse, and phone. He is learning to alert me to when I am displaying bizarre behaviors so that I can refocus or leave the area. Thank you. Um, so this is a, an individual who uh, was in, in huge denial about having her mental illness. Um, in fact, she, she did not want to admit she had mental illness um, at all, period, end of story. And I think that a lot of us with mental illness are like that. Um, you know, we, we don't want to admit that we're different, that we have schizophrenia, which sounds like, you know, in some movie you're going to, you know, become like a chainsaw-wielding killer or something, right? So she did not want to admit she had an illness. She started training her dog to help her. Um, and in the process of doing this, she learned to accept her illness and learned to, that she can take control of her illness. Her illness does not rule her. She rules her illness. And she found that out through training her dog to help her, through training, through looking at exactly the things that, that were made difficult by her schizophrenia and using the dog to, to assist with those things. And like I said before, the hallucination discernment is huge for people with schizophrenia uh, and with hallucinations for other, other disorders. Um, it's just amazing to watch a dog do that, um, do that behavior. Um, and then other things that they can help out with are, um, for example, if you forget your personal identity, and this is helpful with dissociative identity disorder as well.